Hi, I'm Mark S. King, and I'm coming to you from a gymnasium at a college in Grinnell, Iowa. Why? Because this is the first ever HIV criminalization conference. We have here advocates from all over the country who are concerned about the fact that people with HIV are being sent to jail. During this coverage, I'm going to introduce you to people who have actually been criminalized for their HIV status, as well as the advocates who are trying to change the laws in this country about it. So welcome to the first ever HIV is not a crime criminalization conference. Before we launch into the conference, let's define our terms. What is HIV criminalization? HIV specific laws against exposure to the virus, but these are being interpreted by prosecutors to include biting, spitting, or protected consensual sex with someone when HIV could not be transmitted. Prosecutions under existing laws can become more severe if you're living with HIV. A misdemeanor can become a felony. And there are some statutes that allow sentencing to be lengthened simply because the person is living with HIV. This advocacy is not about excusing the actions of anyone intentionally trying to harm someone else, but we have existing laws for that. Defendants in these cases are getting sentences of many decades or having to register as sex offenders. In Iowa, the laws were recently reformed thanks to advocates. I've been living with HIV for 20 years here in Iowa. Six years ago, I met somebody who had been charged and, and sentenced under Iowa's HIV-specific law. I was so moved by his story, I had to get involved. We built a coalition of incredible support, and five days ago, Governor Branstad signed the bill into law. We made change in minds and hearts, and we changed the law by educating community members and legislators. So who are these HIV criminals? Let's meet some. I'm a Lieutenant Colonel in the United States Army. I'm HIV positive. I was prosecuted by the Army under false allegations of HIV exposure with a person with whom I never even had sex. The result of the process, being sent to jail, has really uh, changed or changed my whole outlook on the justice system within the military, and it really has given me doubts about the justice process within you know, the nation itself. I'm a person who was prosecuted for non-disclosing his HIV status a few years ago. And since that moment that I was arrested at work, I've been incarcerated. I spent six months in prison. And I've also, since getting out, I had to register as a sex offender here in the U.S. Um, and that whole experience has really been um, life-changing. The whole experience, every time I have to talk about the, the prosecution, going to jail is always hard, but I'm, I, I love doing it. As hard as it is on me emotionally, I love doing it because it is for me and it's for my family. I, the people that walk up to me and have either thanked me or said, I think I know who you are, or I read something about you, and their emotion and their compassion and empathy that comes to me, really not knowing the, all the details, but just that you're serving your country, you can't believe this happened, and I was prosecuted because I have a virus. I hate the, the idea that people automatically think that uh, a person exposing people to HIV actually has transmitted HIV to someone. Um, this is not the case that what we're speaking of in terms of when I say survivors or, or why people are gathering here to uh, address HIV criminalization. The injustice of criminalization is nearly as frightening to family members. One mom came from Dallas just to find information and support. That everybody else has turned their back on is all the difference in the world. So to you, Cecilia, we applaud you. at the conference, I thought I would just be sitting in the back of the room watching and just watching. So when he was recognizing from the stage, I don't think I've ever been so surprised and it moves me a great deal. If your family's out there, it is going to be a struggle, but there are people that will help and the thing is that you just have to continue to really, really search and and it's taken me this long to find help. And there's a lot of help here. 
HIV criminalization is an international problem, but unfortunately, the United States leads the way in prosecutions. I'm working on this issue internationally, and I'm so impressed by what's happening in here in terms of law reform, but the impact is way beyond the state and the US in, in general. Decriminalization is an international issue, and there is a link between what's happening here in the US and the rest of the world. Now, the US is pretty darn bad in terms of the number of states with, with HIV-specific laws and in terms of the sheer number of unjust prosecutions. But the policies that happen here in the US get exported through PEPFAR money, through USAID money, and in the Global South, particularly in Africa, there's been a whole raft of criminalization laws that have actually been funded by, by the US. And so hopefully people in Africa can say, look, there is a movement now that to say that these things are wrong, these laws are wrong. Don't pass new laws, but actually let's modernize them. Reform is what happened in Iowa recently, and at a special reception, State Senator Matt McCoy made good on Iowa's revised law by removing those prosecuted as sex offenders. For Donald Bogardis and Nick Rhodes, that also meant freedom from their GPS ankle bracelets. At the conference, Avram Pinkelstein, who created the iconic Silence Equals Death artwork as part of an artist collective in the 1980s, facilitated the creation of artistic messages that highlight criminalization. We ended up with a top tier, and the top three out of ten other ideas that were equally as good, I, I need to say, for the record. Uh, one poster talks about fear being more dangerous than HIV. We talk about the fear mongering and how uh, destructive it is and how that leads to various other iterations of criminalization cases, but also the ways that the fear of divide. And then we take a, a, historic, a historical look at other things that were terrible oppressions that seemed okay or that were commonly agreed on all of the time, such as witch hunts and slavery and Japanese and German. So we make some sort of moral equivalency to HIV criminalization. And then the third one is a very simple contention, but I, I feel like the simplest ideas are the, are the best ones, actually. Um, and the tagline is, you care about HIV criminalization, you just don't know it yet. And I'm sort of, we're sort of thinking that this might actually be a campaign because it gives us that, the opening to make many different, to tell many different stories about HIV criminalization to help the reader connect with them. The tragedy of criminalization can be measured in stories like Adam's. With no previous record of any kind and having never infected anyone, Adam was sexually assaulted in prison and had to serve time in isolation. He was found hanging by a sheet in his cell. 
the note he left behind said, this is my only way out. No one listened to me. We observed a moment of silence in his honor. 